Good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank Professor David Shanzer from Sanford's American Grand Strategy Program and Professor Tim Nichols from the Counterterrorism and Public Policy Fellowship Program for hosting today's forum. And of course, to Beth O'Brien and Bo Carlson for making all that magic happen behind the scenes. I'm Kim Kotlar, currently the mentor and coach for Duke Cyber. And it's my distinct honor to moderate our panel of five outstanding women who are serving in a variety of national security positions. What's powerful about our session tonight is the current relevant and diverse real world experiences these professionals bring to us from the Department of Defense, State Department, and the intelligence community. Before I introduce them and to help add some perspective, I would just like to offer a few historical data points on women in the workforce and in national security. I promise we will spend most of our time together this evening hearing from these mid-career professionals about their personal journeys serving our nation. And at the end of the session, we'll save some time for your questions. And of course, everyone's welcome to submit them in the Zoom chat function. Well, women have been involved in many aspects of US national security since our nation was founded. In 1776, Margaret Corbin was the first woman to assume the role of soldier in the American Revolution. And believe it or not, later she actually received a pension for it. In the intelligence community, women served as in espionage as couriers, guides, code breakers, intelligence analysts, and operations officers. At the State Department, it was literally a century ago when Lucille Atchison of Ohio became the first woman accepted into the diplomatic service. And an undersecretary of state said at the time that, quote, Lucille's appointment established a very unfortunate precedent. Well, I think he did not get the last laugh on that quote. Well, let's, now let's fast forward to more modern times. In general, female participation in the civilian and national security workforce has been steadily rising during the past 70 years. In the 1950s, for example, rip, women represented about 30% of the entire US labor force. In the military, women were made a permanent fixture with the passage of the Women's Armed Service Integration Act of 1948 which still prohibited them from combat operations. And it wasn't until 1949 when Eugenie Anderson became the first woman to be named a United States ambassador under President Harry Truman. By 1970 then, women accounted for less than 40% of the national workforce and less than 4% of the armed forces. Your generation, my friends, has seen some progress. For example, in 2016, women comprised about 47% of the overall US workforce and 43.5% of the federal workforce. State Department kept pace right at that 43% mark. The intelligence community slightly lower at 38.8%. And it probably won't surprise any of you to know that only 16.5% of the military was comprised of women. So not only have the numbers changed, but so is the policy albeit more slowly than many of us would like. During the Korean War, when my mother joined the Marines, women were limited to medical and administrative positions and by statute represented less than 2% of the uniformed services. Married or not, having a child was grounds for dismissal. By the time I was fortunate enough to join the Navy in 1977, women comprised about 5.5% of the uniformed services. My work role in the cryptologic career field had just reopened to females, but women could not serve at sea or in combat aircraft. As a matter of fact, I was among the first women with whom many of the male sailors were stationed. Culturally, there was still a residual societal and organizational stigma for women who joined the military. By 2016, with the repeal of the 1994 rule that excluded women from direct combat assignments, all positions in the US military would be open to women unless the services could convince the Secretary of Defense that some should remain closed. 
And I'm happy to say today, we have more women serving in more leadership positions throughout the federal government and the national security community than ever before. But honestly, numbers don't tell the whole story. People do. And today we are going to hear from five amazing professionals who are currently studying at Duke and have generously taken time from their busy schedules to share their views and personal experiences about serving in national security ranks that were on the world. And I'd like to introduce them now. First, Jenny Arnold is a senior civil servant in the Department of Defense with more than 20 years in intelligence and special operations. She began her career as an Air Force enlistee. And after completing her bachelor's degree in criminal justice, she became an intelligence officer for the Central Intelligence Agency. Of note, while in the Air Force, she was assigned to the Joint Special Operations Command and supported major military operations, including Southern Watch, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. She's now a future operations planner with the Department of the Army. My friend, Lieutenant Gia DeHart, is currently in the Naval Reserves after serving eight years on active duty. She's known and respected for her ability to manage crisis and lead change. She created and implemented a crisis operations center in response to the active shooter terrorist attack on the Navy base in Pensacola, Florida in December, 2019. Before that, she, left, she led Coronado Base Emergency Operations Center and the crisis communications response team for a very large scale aviation mishap. In her first assignment, Gia served on board a Navy ship, the USS Anchorage, and we'll be excited to hear more about that experience later. Gia graduated from the Naval Academy. Next up, Lieutenant Colonel Randy Farrell is a US Army Public Affairs Officer. Just before coming to Duke, she was the lead communicator for Special Operations Forces in countering terrorism across North Africa and the Levant. Earlier in her career, she was a signal officer and had multiple deployments to Iraq. She graduated from the US Military Academy and also holds an MBA from Wharton. Lieutenant Colonel Tina Hayes, our fourth panelist, has devoted her career to preventing some very, very bad things from happening. She's a senior leader specializing in nuclear counterproliferation and countering weapons of mass destruction or as we in the community say for shorthand, WMD. Tina served in a variety of staff positions focusing on WMD threat reduction, military support to domestic WMD threats, and counterproliferation of WMD. She graduated from ROTC with a degree in chemistry and spent the early part of her career in the Army Corps of Engineers. She also holds two master's degree the first in forensic toxicology, and the second in combating weapons of mass destruction. And last, but certainly not least, and rounding out our panel tonight, is Supervisory Special Agent Margalit Murray. Margalit is a diplomatic security federal agent in the US Department of State. She joined state in 2004 and has been stationed overseas at US embassies in hotspots such as Kabul, Tel Aviv, and Beirut, as well as a lovely spot in Buenos Aires. Domestically, Margalit served in the Diplomatic Security Washington Field Office. And she also managed federal investigations at the headquarters. In, and the investigations ranged from human trafficking, visa and passport fraud, sexual assault, child sexual abuse and identity fraud. Most recently, Margalit completed a tour as a legislative affairs liaison representing the Department of State's policies and priorities to Congress. She holds a master's degree in international law and security from GW and was a Fulbright, a Fulbright scholar in Kuwait City, Kuwait. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna jump in with both feet. And this first question will be for all our panelists. I'd like to know why you decided to pursue a career in national security and what motivates you to continue. We'll start with Jenny, turn it over to Gia, then Randy, Tina, and 
hitting the pit in, in the power position will be Margalit. So Jenny, let's start with you. Hi Kim, thanks so much for having us tonight. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I would say as a little girl, I was always very inquisitive about what was happening in the world. Um, I wanted to be a part of something that was bigger than me. Um, so I ended up you know, following my passion and just going for it. I left a small town in New England and knew that I just wanted to, to see the world. Um, as far as what keeps me motivated, it's definitely not the money, it's the mission. You know, we, uh, we get involved in some amazing things and I'm very proud of that. Thanks for having me tonight, Kim. So I don't come from a military family, but I grew up watching my family, particularly my mom, who's a nurse, make personal sacrifices for complete strangers. And I think that instilled a sense of service inside of me. So when I watched the Twin Towers fall on 9-11 in sixth grade, I knew that I wanted to pursue a career in national security. And after experiencing the terrorist attack during my last tour on active duty, I am even more motivated to continue serving in public service because I've seen, particularly in policy, how so many things from state gun policy to debates on encryption can tie into something like a domestic terrorist attack and ultimately national security. You might have to say similar to Jenny. Uh, it was, uh, I was inquisitive as a young child. Uh, so my dad started taking me around to the civil war bases. So I became interested in the military. And then my grandfather once said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, well, I want to be president. I didn't think that <laughs> that was too much of a dream. And he said, well, uh, the biggest weakness for female politicians is they don't know the military. So you need to join the military. And the best way to become a, a good military officer is to go to West Point because it makes you the best leader, the best version of yourself. Uh, so that's what started my path. And then to continue, um, the Army and uh, the, the United States in general, but the Army specifically gave me opportunities to see the world and make a difference everywhere I was, whether it was 2003 in Iraq and seeing young children and what they were challenged with or uh, being in Syria, you know, 18 years later and uh, seeing the change uh, that we were still making around the world, a, a change for good. Good evening. Thanks, Kim, for having us. Um, I, too, wanted to travel the world when I was younger. I just didn't know how I was going to do it. Um, I had a priest at my church who was a chaplain in the Army, and so he convinced me to join ROTC, and I have stayed not, not only for the mission, as, as Jenny alluded to, but also because of the people. The people keep you going, and they keep you motivated, and you build those strong bonds with teams. Thank you, ladies. What I'm hearing in these common themes is a sense of selfless service and a commitment to something larger than yourself and a commitment that begins at a very early age. And I think what you bring to the table is that sense of service and duty and sacrifice. And it's not really about the money, it's really about the mission. So thank you all for that. Next, I'd like to turn to a question for our, at our, for our military folks. I'd like to know why you decided to pursue a career in national security. I'm sorry, exact. I'd like to know why you decided to pursue a career in the military, why that's important to you, and how is it difficult or um, in some ways different from other public service? Randy, let's start with you. Sure, uh, Kim, it's a great question. Um, from my perspective, I really thought, uh, and ha it's um, been true, is in the Army, in the military, you're judged by your performance. Uh, it rewards ingenuity and work ethic um, with different education opportunities, broadening career possibilities. Um, and you can go from setting up satellites in 2003, again, in Iraq, uh, to working on branding at West Point, uh, driving brand equity for the Army and recruiting, to uh, working in special operations uh, in the Middle East in a way that uh, you don't get that many opportunities in uh, one career. I think from a, a con perspective, um, the Army is making strides, but it's still a very uh, male dominated uh, organization that somewhat frames the work life balance based on a man that has a, a, a spouse at home that can take care of the kids. And I think that becomes a detriment um, to women that have children and are trying to uh, blend their career and the family. 
Um, I think it would be different if it was a kinetic war, a, a short conflict, but uh, for those of us on this panel, 20 years when your entire career, you could be gone for a year, back for a year and gone for a year. Uh, I think it challenges us. And I, I think we're finding that a lot of men that are putting a family first are finding that challenge as well. Thank you. Tina, how about you? Thank you. I mean, I agree with a lot of Randy's points. Um, I stay and continue to serve because I enjoy it. I'm a military family with me and my husband. We both serve together. So we're dual military. So we understand a lot of the challenges um, that Randy talks to. And we discuss it a lot as he is a leader in his community now with teaching young younger captains and how to um, overcome a lot of those hurdles that come with the Married Army Couples Program, which you know, has come, come far, but not very far. If, if you can look back to your 20 year career, you don't really see a lot of change, but there is some change. And a lot of the times with like what Randy was saying with the working women and the moms and the new fathers that have to wait longer to have families so they can get a career going, it can be hard. It can be really hard on the families, but I, I agree that it's getting better especially with the um, three month um, maternity leave now versus the six weeks, which was what it was seven years ago. Gia? It, there was no plan for me to join the military. It wasn't something that people from my high school in Center City, Philadelphia did. It was something that my college guidance counselor tried to talk me out of. And it was even something that my congressional office tried to talk me out of when I pursued a nomination to the Naval Academy. And when I think about why I continue to serve in the reserves, I think about, and when I think about the cons, I think about this like analogy I had when I was at the Naval Academy. And when you walked to class, there was this brick pathway from the dorms to the building called Stribling Walk that everyone marches down. And it's really funny when all of the midshipmen are marching to do a parade because inevitably there is someone who trips on these bricks, you know? So if you focus really closely on all of these bricks that are tripping you up every day, it's really easy to see some of the cons about the military, which is the demands on the time, the frequent moves, things like that. But then there was this four mile loop that I used to run and it went to a memorial, a military memorial. And from there on this hill, you could look back at the Naval Academy. And from that view, the campus was, was beautiful. And whenever I would do that run, I would get this feeling of being connected to something bigger than myself. And it helped me, you know, remind me of why I, I do what I do. Um, and so that's why I continue to serve in the reserves is wanting to be part of something bigger than myself. Thank you, ladies. Marguerite, I'd like to ask you a different question. Can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? And then what exactly does a diplomatic security federal agent do? And how does that fit into the overall mission of the Department of State? Well, uh, thank you again for having me. Um, you caught me at the perfect time because the train's gonna come by in a second. So bear with me as it gets closer. Um, and everyone who lives in Durham understands about the train, I guess. Um, so, you're gonna to have to give me a second as it goes by or I'm gonna to have to talk really loud. Oh good, it's the Amtrak, it's going really fast. Okay, all right, it's gone. So um, I'm, I didn't shoot for the stars like Randy did when I was younger, I wanted to be Secretary of State. I didn't know at the age of 16 about political appointees and whatnot. I thought if I became a diplomat, I was could one day possibly lead the department. So that's sort of where I started out. Um, and I really just wanted to sort of work in any sort of capacity that would take me overseas, that would introduce me to foreign cultures, that would have me learning new languages and sort of obtaining that um, type of career experience. Um, so much like many of the people probably in the audience today, I was putting in applications with all the three letter agencies in DC, primarily the ones that would get me overseas. Um, and thankfully out of that came a job offer with the State Department actually had two job offers. I had one as a public diplomacy officer and one as a special agent. And the special agent one came first 
And I was extremely curious. I had never served in law enforcement. I don't know anyone who had served in law enforcement at that point in time. Um, but I jumped on it and I'm really, really happy that I did so because it's taken me off in a completely different direction that I never knew I would have started down. Um, and so many people might wonder, okay, so State Department, you think only diplomacy. Well, State Department, just like many other federal agencies in the government has a law enforcement and security branch. And that is the Bureau of Diplomatic Security. And there is primarily two main missions. Uh, we are a law enforcement agency, so we do conduct criminal investigations. Those are federal investigations. We focus on visa and passport fraud, and specifically, we always prioritize cases that have links to terrorism, human trafficking, drug smuggling, alien smuggling, um, any sort of organized crime, we will prioritize those types of cases. DS has offices in 29 different US cities, and we have agents overseas at 270 embassies and consulates overseas. The second and the largest mission and the largest funded mission uh, for the Bureau of Diplomatic Security is our security and risk uh, responsibilities for the State Department. So we protect people, information, and our places overseas. So the conduct of diplomacy. How do we keep our diplomats safe so that they can do, our jo do their job? Um, and in doing so, DS also overseas does a lot of security liaison with host governments and different foreign governments will provide training and security assistance. Thank you, that was excellent. Sounds like there's been a little bit of serendipity in your career and I'm guessing maybe for all of you, um, serendipity has been part of your journey as well. So um, Jenny, I'd like to ask you a question. Notwithstanding the old joke about working in the IC that goes something like this, well, I'd tell you what I, what I do, my friend, but then I'd have to shoot you. So what can you share about your jobs and what, the jo what is the job satisfaction like if you really can't talk to people about what you do? Yeah, so uh, when I first started that journey, it was, it was definitely something you had to get used to. It can be very isolating at times. You kind of feel like you're living in a bubble with the people that understand you and then everyone else is kind of an outsider. Um, but as, as my career went along, you know, I'm lucky to have a husband who's also in special operations. So we kind of had this bubble that we lived in together with our children. Um, but the unique opportunities that came with it, you know, I went from meeting with a nuclear scientist to meeting with someone who was, you know, looking at quantum computing to learning about biosafety. And you just kind of become a jack of all trades. And I never got bored. Uh, I loved every second of it. Um, now that I'm older and I'm kind of, you know, stepping away from the operational side of it, um, you know, it's fun to look back at all the things that we did, but I'll tell you the hardest is keeping it from your kids, not because it's hard to lie to them. It is hard, but they know when you're lying to them and they know when something is awkward or off. And so they were always my biggest challenge, keeping it from them. What's been your most exciting job in the intelligence community and now as an army operational planner? Um, I would say my time at uh, JSOC was really exciting. Um, you know, we were involved in uh, the 9-11 you know, hit right, right when we were working on, um, you know, not really, not really thinking about those types of threats. You know, the, the, the folks were just training and planning and then along comes 9-11 and the whole world changed. Um, you know, one of the hardest things I had to do was uh, escort my acting commander to tell a spouse that her husband was killed in combat because everyone was forward deployed. Um, so those were, you know, some of the some of the things that stuck with me that kept me going throughout the years of why I do what I do. Um, but then I've had some amazing opportunities. I've flown all over the world. I've, you know, eaten in fancy restaurants and met with some really fun and crazy people. And um, I would do it all over again if I could. Thank you. Tina, I have a question for you now. Would you like to highlight some of your experiences that you've had preparing for both the domestic response and overseas contingency planning for a WMD incident? And can you also comment on the differences in duties between operational command assignments and your staff positions? And finally, I really wanna know what's more fun? Thanks, Kim. Um, I've done a, a full realm of um, 
planning and operations for combating weapons of mass destruction. I started in this field at um, the Joint Task Force Civil Support, which most people have never heard of, but it's based out of currently uh, Fort Eustis, Virginia, and they do all domestic response or military domestic response for the United States. So they look at hurricanes, they look at flooding, they look at anything that is nuclear, biological, chemical. So as we were going through this year of the pandemic, I was thinking back to my um, planning during that time in 2009 to 11, when we were planning for the next pandemic and just kind of thinking through how this was gonna occur and whatnot. So it was good to see that, yes, there is a plan and that it, it, it went through. Um, and then I did some time at the Defense Threat Reduction Agency um, looking at um, threat facilities. And then my last station was at the uh, US Army Special Operations Command where I did um, training and operations for the um, Special Operations Unit in combating weapons of mass destruction which was incredibly fun. And that was mostly due to the incredible team that I had around me and how supportive the command was of that um, training plan and trying to get it into the operations realm as well. That's a great answer. And I've often found that it's not precisely what you're doing, but sometimes it's the people and the team and who you get to come into work, the dedicated professionals that you see every day. So I, I, that definitely resonates with me. Um, Gia, a question for you. Would you please describe a professional experience where you felt that you individually or you as part of a team made a significant contribution to either your organization's mission or to national security? Kim, I, I can't answer this question without talking about the efforts of the team uh, in response to the terrorist attack in Pensacola. And so as a background, the command I was at, Naval Aviation Schools Command, trains about 3,000 Naval Aviation students each year enlisted an officer. And there's this huge plaque at the front of the building that says, through these doors walk the future of Naval Aviation. And that's because it's the only building that every single Navy, Naval Aviator in the Navy has trained at. And so moving on um, to the terrorist attack and, our and the success of our team, when I think about it and I think about my experience in crisis response, I realized that in a crisis, you have no choice but to respond. You know, if you're in a plane and, and your engine fails, you don't have a choice, you have to act. And oftentimes that decision, it can be the difference between life and death. And, and more often it is between life and death. Um, but it's not just what you do when you respond, it's, it's how you do it. And I can't do the story justice in the time we have, but I'll just say that the, sex, the success of our team lied in the how. And so we were guided by an amazing, empathetic, and trusting commanding officer who gave one simple mission to respond to something so disastrous, which was do what's right. And we were guided by three principles, which was to take care of the fallen and their families, to take care of the injured and to take care of ourselves. And sometimes doing what's right isn't very clear. It could be choosing between strict procedural compliance or honoring the request of a grieving parent. And so how does taking care of people tie into national security? You know, our efforts might not be as direct as like achieving a tactical win on the battlefield, but taking care of your people impacts civil military relations at the highest levels of the United States government. It's going to influence the retention of our top performers when we think of those 3000 students impacted by our actions. And just like 9-11 um, influenced me, this terrorist attack in our command's response, and I'm talking from a senior leader, senior leader talking to the most junior ranking enlisted person one-on-one, -on -one, and holding them in their grief, it's going to influence the, the, the future generation of admirals and master chiefs 30 years from now and how they lead their teams during times of crisis. Thank you, Gia. That was a really thoughtful and incredibly moving personal response to that question. And I, I appreciate that. Randy, I'd like to take a different tack now on the type of question I'd like to ask you. Um, and this one's gonna be a little bit more relevant to what's going in our, 
going on in our world today. How will the role of a public affairs officer change in response to our changing threat environment where misinformation and disinformation can have major consequences both at home and abroad? Randy, over to you. Um, I don't think it will change the role of a public affairs officer. I think it's gonna require us to be more proactive and engaged so our commanders empower us to shape the information space and not simply provide a press release um, after something has happened, along with other information specialties like psychological operations, um, cyber, and some of the other uh, tools. We're going to have to push for a better understanding with our commanders. Uh, we need to understand what the national security objective is so that the messaging of it can be delegated to us. That way we can frame and prime the communication to educate the American audience, but also um, the global audience so that the truth wins out uh, from day one. An example I can use uh, comes from February of 2018. Um, I was fortunate to learn those lessons and had really good bosses beforehand. Um, so I was empowered when I had the Washington Post, CNN International, um, and NPR with me in Syria. And we had been in Raqqa, uh, one day, Manbij the next day. Um, and from a Manbij perspective, before we left that morning, we were seeing uh, some signs of the Russian Wagner group um, and the uh, Syrian uh, forces, they were gonna come across Derizor. So rather than waiting, I already had my staff working on messaging that could be used at the national level. Um, and we started pushing all the way up to CENTCOM and to DOD to lean forward in this messaging. Um, Typically, we would have waited till the next day. This was starting to happen at 10 or 11 o'clock uh, local Syria time. And I sat down with my boss and I was like, we need to get with General Rotel. We need to tell what's happening now. We need to frame it because Russia always gets in front, in front of us. And we're doing the page 18 correction, not the page one headline. Um, having the news media with me that night, I was able to get General Rotel to quickly approve something as our, as air um, support was still coming in, people were still engaged in the fight. I was able to have the Post, CNN, and NPR frame it to the global audience um, before Russia could even get into the news cycle the next day. Uh, we had released footage of that evening, um, so they could not even spin it. They couldn't say that it wasn't them. Um, as their injured were coming back, it started putting uh, focus on the Russian audience at home. Um, and, and it was the way that we have to be able to do our job. Um, we, we can't wait for someone else to tell our story and we can't pretend as public it's affairs officers. Oh, I'm sorry. We can't pretend uh, that we're only speaking to an American audience. Everything we put out with the internet and social media as it is, we're framing the entire global uh, audience perception and, of our actions. That is spot on. And it seems now more than ever, not only is the medium the message, but it's how well we operate within that observe, orient, decide, and act loop. And he who gets to the media first apparently wins. Um, I'd like to turn it over to the other uh, panelists to see if anyone has an additional comment they'd like to make about this whole notion of information and disinformation and how that changes the nature of our jobs in national security. Any takers for that one? Okay, well then we'll move on to our next topic. And can that topic, I'm sorry, one, go ahead. Can I just, Please. Where I said that from a global audience, I think we're learning the same lessons domestically. Um, if we don't manage what's happening in our own, uh, what's happening with freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, there's a line where it's the same domestic terrorism issues here and it's gonna frame how we're perceived elsewhere. So we've looked at it from a national security perspective only to foreign audiences. And we're gonna to have to figure out what tools are necessary for the FBI and other domestic law enforcement to handle it uh, domestically. I totally agree with that, how Homeland Security and economic security and national security are so intertwined now, especially as a, we think about the speed of, of the message and the speed of cyber. Okay, so now I'd like to turn to a slightly different topic. And this one is really near and dear to my heart and it's mentoring. 
And I will say during my three different careers, one as a Naval officer, second as a staffer on Capitol Hill, and as an executive with the National Security Agency, I don't think I would have been successful without the benefit of mentors, both men and women, and if I had not taken an active role in mentoring and helping others, both men and women. As a matter of fact, if you'll allow me a personal moment, I believe several of my mentors are in our audience today. So a quick shout out to retired Army Lieutenant General Hodges, retired Navy Captains Giannuzzi, Barnett and O'Neill, and from the Hill, my dear friends and women, I could not have lived without Sally and Sylvia. Thank you all. And I also know that I have folks who I've mentored in the audience. So a quick shout out to all of you as well. So back to the question at hand. It has three parts for each of our panelists. One, would you explain the value of having a mentor and being a mentor in your career trajectory? Two, does gender matter and if so, why? And lastly, how do you find your mentors and what attributes would you look for and avoid in selecting someone? Jenny, let's start with you. Thanks, Kim. I'd say, um... The most important part about finding a good mentor is partnering with someone that has the same interests or career as you so that you can learn from them. You know, starting off in the careers that we're in, you need a lot of guidance to not make mistakes because the mistakes are so crucial in what we do. Um, you need to find someone who's willing to put in the time with you, not someone who's just doing it because they want to check a box and be a mentor, but someone that's actually gonna take the time to get to know you and your family and guide you through the times that they know that something is off or, or you need a, an extra shove that day. Um, avoid those that are self-serving. You know, Don't just find a mentor that you think is gonna get you somewhere. Find a mentor that you connect with and you click with. Um, I've been very blessed to have some amazing mentors throughout my career, um, most of which have been men just by the nature of uh, most of the places I've worked you know, early on in my career were, were male dominated. Um, I've recently started getting a handful of women mentors and it, it definitely makes a difference in how I present myself and how I'm seen by others. Um, so get both perspectives because I think it's invaluable. That's awesome. Gia, over to you now. Without a doubt, I would not be where I am today if it wasn't for my mentors. And I think looking back, I've had two, or I've either had or I've needed two types of mentors. And it's those, you know, who believe in me when I don't believe in myself. And then those who give me a kick in the rear when, when, I may, when maybe I don't want to do something. Um, does gender matter? You know, I thought that it did. But looking back, most of my closest mentors were men. And I had women mentors available to me. And I think what mattered more for me was a shared experience and that experience being parenthood. And it doesn't really matter if you're a man or a woman, but at least being able to acknowledge and talk about the challenges of being a working mom. And the male mentors that I took, that I spoke to, they actually were the ones who helped me learn to put my family first and otherwise I probably wouldn't have. Um, for the last part of your question, you know, I don't think I've met any of my mentors through a formal program. So my advice to people when trying to build mentors is not to be, don't be afraid to talk to people. In the military, we have a very formal rank structure and a lot of junior officers in the military really struggle to find mentors. And I always just, I realized there, there might be shiny brass on someone's collar with their rank, but everyone's still a human being and learn how to strike a professional balance between being yourself and being authentic and, and also being respectful and professional. And I think those relationships will just happen naturally. I think the most important traits are availability, someone who wants to talk to you, humility and honesty, you know, just tell me straight what I need to hear. Thank you, Gia. Randy, would you like to add your personal thoughts on this one? Sure, I'm gonna try not to be repetitive because I think what Gia and Jenny said uh, hit straight to home, but I think it's really about finding a mentor that you can have a honest, no judgment conversation with um, and solicit the best advice and allow you to, that allows you to make the best decisions for your career. You can um, 
maybe show warts and all on, on uh, some of the choices that you're making. And I think it helps by finding someone to Jenny's point um, that has a trajectory that you'd like to follow. So you can listen and learn from their experiences where they succeeded and failed without having to go through those experiences yourself, um, which may help in, enhance your career. Um, and it has to be someone that has your best interest in mind, not just out of the organization. So their advice may take you out of national security. It may take you out of the military, but they know what's probably best for you. Um, and I find it um, mentoring people rewarding for those same reasons. And I try to have those same qualities when I'm working with someone. I look at it as investing in the next generation of leaders and having them have that exponential effect on generations to come. And then to the, to the last point, I, I think you're gonna find this in, in this audience is most of us have not had female mentors. Uh, I was talking to a, a really good male friend of mine and I said, I haven't had one really good female mentor because I haven't seen one in the national security realm that I wanted to be like. I happen to have male mentors um, that were setting example with their character, uh, their intelligence and uh, their tenacity. And that's who I wanted to become. But I will say my mentors have been peer women um, in their career that I could talk to, that we were having similar experiences and we could mentor each other in a way we weren't finding um, from previous generations because many of them weren't in national security or the military at this point in time. I think that whole notion of peer mentorship is really important and um, you can't live without friends and colleagues for, the, for your own success or the success of, of your mission. Um, Tina, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what the ladies have already mentioned and I agree that with, along with what Randy and Jenny and Gia have said that it's hard to find mentors in your field and um, that are females because it's at this point in time in my own field, I am one of the most senior females in my field. There are no 06 females in my field whatsoever. So for me, I've had lots of men that have, you know, taken me and mentored me along the way, and they haven't always been in my field. So I find that it's also helpful to get other perspectives from other fields, having them look at where you want to go and how you want to get there. And they can always help assist best they can, even though they are not in your field. Um, I also think that mentors don't even have to be in your own grade spectrum as well. I, I get a lot, I have a lot of uh, former enlisted members that are mentors to me in my field, and they have brought me along and helped me out immensely. Um, and then, what was it? Oh, and I, I honestly don't think that gender matters whatsoever, as long as you find someone that cares and wants to take you and avoid those that you find to be toxic altogether. Marguerite, would you bring us home for this question? Yeah, I agree with so much of what's already been said. Um, I would say the biggest value for me was having a mentor who instilled confidence and trust, especially early on in the career, because that's the point when I think what Gia had said, like one of her types of mentors is you need someone who can tell you that you can do it, especially when you're in that initial stage of sort of doubt and it's all new and I'm still learning. Um, I think there's also value in short and long-term mentors. Sometimes it's function and sometimes it's career. So I've definitely had functional mentors at every single assignment that I've been in, you know, because we switch every two to three years. I might find myself doing something that's quite different from what I was doing before. And in each assignment, I've found that person who's been willing to sort of share expertise, time, um, energy with me. But then over the course of my career, I've had two or three really critical long-term career mentors. And that's sort of a very different relationship for me um, with each of them. I would say gender does not matter. Um, some of the, my functional mentors have been women, have been men. My long-term career mentors have all been men. DS, even though State Department has a much better gender diversity, DS is only 13% female. And especially as you start going up the ranks, it gets less and less. So uh, just like Tina, Sometimes I'm, in the, I'm the only woman in the room. Um, that's just a common occurrence in my field. Um, I would say finding a mentor, just like Vince commented here, State Department has all these sort of official programs, but the best way I've found mentors has been again through function and through long-term career development. Uh, and I would say there is, uh, it's really important when choosing a mentor or when developing that mentor relationship that you find someone who is not trying to shape you in their own image. 
um, because that can lead to a lot of professional frustration. Each of us are unique individuals. We're gonna have our own life experiences and our own life goals. That's really gonna sort of determine where we wanna go, what we wanna do at a certain point in time. So having a mentor who can continue to coach you and develop your career, no matter what sort of life consequences are happening at that current time is really, really important. That's really excellent point. And I think all of you are great mentors and you've all benefit from having been mentored. And so I appreciate your insights on that. So in the interest of time, and I have many, many more questions as you can imagine, but I'd like now to turn it over to our audience to deal with some of the questions that are pressing for them. We'll start first with Grace Gaverick. I hope I said that right. Grace, what would you like to ask these ladies? Right. Um, again, thank you all for being here. It's been an honor to hear you talk, especially as a young woman who wants to pursue a career in national security. My question for you um, is that as senior ranking female intelligence and military officers, um, how do you establish credibility and respect in those regions and cultures, um, just namely some of the countries in the Middle East where men are still held in a higher regard and women are viewed as less capable? And just kind of adding on to that, have you ever had any issues with this in meetings or encounters? I could definitely jump on that question if you'd like, since I've served in several Middle Eastern countries and I'm sure as have my colleagues. Um, there's an interesting phenomenon that's actually happened and it's, I think some uh, historians or sociologists have written about this, um, about Western women working in Middle Eastern cultures. And it's almost like you're the third sex. You're not quite um, treated as a Middle Eastern female and you're not treated as a Middle Eastern man, you're treated as this other. Um, and it's sort of allowed space for me to operate in and function in in order to have, you know, working relationships with my counterparts. Um, you're still going to be treated differently. You just have to understand and accept that and work through the norms and cultures. I've had to put on headscarves before in order to attend meetings. I've had to learn how to put my hand and sort of nod with my chest and not try to shake a hand. So you learn certain like simple cultural norms and workarounds. Um, but I've never found that it has once inhibited me. I also come with the backing of the United States, you know, Department of State and all of the power that we convey in whatever country you're in. And that definitely lends itself to being heard. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, I, I kind of have a funny story. Uh, again, when, when I was in JSOC, uh, we had a trip that we were going on and part of the interview to, to work there is, you know, how do you feel about working in a room full of just men? What if you have to spend the night in the same tent with them? You know, how will you handle that? And of course, you know, I, I was, I was fine. Uh, but there came a time where there was a trip, my bags were packed, everything was loaded. And they came to me and said, you can't go because we have no place for you to sleep. You're the only female on the trip. And therefore we're going to have to scrap you. And I was so disappointed because I really wanted to go on that trip. Uh, but conversely, to, to add to what Marguerite said, uh, at the agency, it actually was a, a help on many occasions because you are sort of viewed differently. Um, I, most of my male colleagues told me up front, hey, you're going to have it a little bit easier with some of these cases because they're not going to step up to you and confront you and, and you know, question your authority. They're just gonna go with it because they're kind of afraid they don't know how to deal with you. And I definitely found that to be true. Thank you. I'd like to move on to another question if, unless someone has something else they need to, just burning to add. Nope. So let's go next to Deborah Aids. Deborah, over to you. Hi, yeah, thank you all for taking the time to talk to us. This has been so helpful. Um, so going forward, where do you see women at that civil military policy intersection and how can women who are already at this intersection leverage their position to create tangible process for other women who are aspiring to go into national security, politics and foreign relations? I can answer that a little bit, Kim. Deborah, I, I think it's a great question. I think you're seeing across the departments, uh, not 
a great majority, but several women um, in senior positions. Um, and so it's giving, it's allowing us to see a mentor. So, uh, you know, my husband asked, why is it so important to Kamala Harris as vice president? It, okay, it's a first. I said, because it gives little girls and even 40 year old women <laughs> the aspiration that it can be done. And I, I think that that helps uh, to one point. The second is, I think it's women and men. I think there's, all, I, I think when we have these conversations, we forget that the, many of the leaders have been raised by phenomenal mothers um, and have daughters and they want to see their daughters have the same opportunities they have. So to Tina's point, they're looking at retention, yes, but they're changing the pregnancy policy. Um, they're looking at the fact that um, something as basic as hair could be changed in policy. Um, they're looking at um, you can leave for two or three years and come back in the service, both in federal opportunities and in active duty and reserve military. Um, they're seeing that you don't have to act just like a man to be successful, that uh, to, the, to the rest of the ladies on the panel, that the qualities women bring are not gonna be exactly the same. Um, so let's find ways to keep them in our service and I'll pass it on to the rest of the panel. I'll just add from the State Department's point of view, uh, definitely, I think we've all like talked a lot about diversity and everyone's, you know, it's like, yes, let's diversify and we um, love diversity, but it's the inclusion that's the harder part. Um, and it's making sure that people stay in the job so that at the mid-level and upper mid-levels, women are not leaving for all of the many pressures that they face due to being a mother or having to take care of children or having to take care of an elderly relative or whatnot that we create policies within our departments that help to include and also to sustain employment. Um, and I think that's also something that sadly we've seen take a massive toll over the last year due to the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of women have been bearing um, both the brunt of maintaining their professional careers and also now you know, being teacher slash chef slash, you know, nanny um, as well. So, and I'm sure others on this panel would know better than I, um, but the inclusion part is so incredibly important at this point. And just one more point to add, you know, as a um, dual military couple, um, everyone, at, a lot of the senior officers or your senior mentors will tell you, one of you has to choose who's going to take priority. And what my husband and I have found is that it's not who is going to take priority. It's who's, you know, how do you manage both your careers so you can both be successful and both hit your milestones. So we just prioritize who's moving where at what time vice whose job is more important. I think those are all super insightful points, especially about the balancing act with two careers, having children, trying to be all you can be um, at work and at home. And, and it's tough. And I so admire you women for doing that in this, in today's environment, especially. We're gonna take another question now. This one from Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. Hey, Kim, thank you. Uh, thanks for the privilege of being a part tonight. And I'm so proud of you. You were such a terrific uh, uh, staffer for Congressman Thornberry when I was a brand new Army uh, legislative liaison officer. And I think you were the mentor. I was the mentee uh, in that relationship. Um, I also want to say that listening tonight is Lieutenant General Laura Potter, who is the G2 for the United States Army. Uh, not only is she the best intelligence officer I've ever met, she's also one of the absolute best officers uh, I've ever known. And so I'm glad that Laura's uh, listening in tonight. And finally, I'm also proud that my class at West Point, um, Beat Navy, was a uh, class of 1980, the first class with women. And uh, I'm so proud of what they accomplished. My question to each of you incredible people is what policy would you want to see changed? If you had the chance to talk to Secretary Blinken or Secretary Austin and say, you've got to fix this, what policy uh, would you want to see changed? Thanks a lot. Jenny, would you like to start? I think for me, you know, having also raised three children in this, in this environment, you know, for over 20 years, um, similar to what Tina said earlier, just understanding that women have a role as a, 
as a mother, but also as a professional and policies that will support them being able to take time off when the baby is born and not have it adversely impact their careers. Tim, I can go next. I, I'm assuming that uh, Lieutenant General Retired Hodges is referencing from a female perspective. Uh, my senior thesis at West Point was uh, women's work and family conflict from June Cleaver to Madonna. Uh, not much has changed in the 20 years that I've been in the military. I think it's across uh, the federal government. Um, do what private business is doing with childcare policy. Um, you could go on different forums. And I think that's the biggest uh, obstacle for us is we've got um, child care centers, but there's a year and a half long wait list. Um, if you're both active duty, it's hard on the schedule. Make them 24 hours in some cases. Look at child care policy uh, uh, for the thing that can change and help men and women stay in the service. This is not so much a policy that I'd like to see changed. And I don't know if it's Navy specific, but since I've joined the Navy, I've never seen someone transfer to a command and get paid on time. They're, the system, I'd like to see the systems updated so that when our junior sailors join and we onboard them into the Navy and we, you know, into a company, um, that we pay them on time with the benefits that we gave them. And when you think about it from a private company standpoint, you would never bring a new employee on board and then not pay them at the end of the month. So I'd like to see the IT systems overhauled. I'll uh, go ahead and um, sort of mimic what Randy had also said is that I think we need, and it's not just for the federal government or state governments or local governments. I think there needs to be paid maternity leave, um, affordable childcare options across the board countrywide. Because if we wanna talk about diversity and inclusion and getting women access into the national security sphere, you don't wanna have the advertisement being come and work for us, but the benefits are not great. You want it to be, the benefits are gonna be amazing or no matter where you go, you have option to still have a family and still have a career. And with that, I think will flow diversity and inclusion and many more women into the national security field. Yeah, and, and I wanna tag on with the, um, the, the parenting. I think that in the army, the males only get still 10 days as a father for paternity leave and women now get the three months. However, those first 10 days after coming home are really hard and they don't really get much easier, but I think somewhere along the lines of either equal to, or at least a little bit longer than two um, workday weeks, or, you know what I mean? Um, for the husband to be home and helping, especially after having like a C-section for the mother, that would be incredibly helpful um, for new parents, especially. Thank you. It seems like that work-life balance keeps coming back for us as a recurring theme. And, and I think it's important. And if leaders are out there listening to this, hopefully we can start making some additional progress. Um, I'd like to now turn it over to um, Emma Dries for her question. Thanks, Kim. Um, first off, I would like to thank you all for taking the time to speak with us. This has been a, a really incredible event. I was wondering what advice you would give to undergraduates interested in national security and what we should consider before pursuing a career. I can start with that one, Kim. Um, follow your passion. You know, as a young girl growing up on a dairy farm, no one in my family went to college. You didn't leave New England, but I had this vision in my head that I was going to go work for the CIA someday. And I remember my, uh, my high school uh, guidance counselor saying, you know, maybe you should consider a trade. And that just lit a fire in me, you know, and I pursued it and I crawled my way through. Uh, I joined, joined the military and I did one class at a time so I could afford college and I followed my dream and, and it worked. Um, so don't ever give up. If there's something you want to do, go for it, apply, put your, put yourself out there. I'll go a little bit different and say, um, on the opposite of pursuing the passion would be like, take whatever job you get that gets your foot in the door and then bloom where you're planted. Um, in my experience, out of all of the jobs I've had in the Navy, I didn't want any of them. So I was never happy with the job that I got. Um, 
but I just had this attitude that I was going to work hard and make the best at where I was at. And often a lot of my peers have seen some of my experiences and said, oh, wow, like you were really lucky that that happened to you. And eventually one of my mentors said like, no, you weren't lucky. Luck is where hard work meets opportunity. So you never know when that opportunity is going to arise. So work hard um, wherever you are. And what I would want you to know going into it or something to consider is I think, especially for women, we think that a national security leader looks a certain way and leads a certain way. And the best advice that I could give is to just be true to yourself, be genuine, stick to your personality, you know, don't try to be someone that you're not. And eventually your leadership style will emerge. I'll uh, go ahead and just quickly recommend, um, like uh, Gia just said, try everything as an undergrad right now. Um, it's a competitive job market. It's a competitive field. So apply to everything. Apply to every internship that you think sounds even remotely interesting. Um, and make sure not to, um, what's that advice they give you now? If, if you don't meet all the requirements, you know, you feel like you shouldn't apply. No, just apply even if you only meet half of the requirements listed on the job application, just go ahead and apply and just try. Um, or volunteer, just, I would say as an undergrad, if you have the means to volunteer, then do so. If you don't have the means, then apply to every single government job you can think of. Kim, I would just add, don't limit yourself. Um, your potential is only gonna be limited by your own curiosity. And when you're making a, a decision to pursue a career in national security, it does not have to be your forever career. I, I think the challenge in the military is sometimes we think we have to be there for 20 years. You could do a, a military career, active, National Guard or Reserve. You can go to the State Department, you don't like it after five years, you can get out. You can go into the FBI, you can get out. You can go to try to go to the CIA and you can get out. But take those experiences because you may learn that there's another career path of public policy or another volunteer organization after that that you never would have thought of. So let it take you somewhere um, in a path undetermined to, to Gia's point. Yeah, I, I agree, Randy. I mean, it's a choose your own adventure and be comfortable with your choices and when you are done with that particular choice choose another adventure just you know follow what jenny said your passion this is just incredible advice from all of you and one thing i would like to add is that once you start a career in the federal government and the national security arena arena more and more this whole notion of joint duty or of going to different uh, stations or different federal agencies to broaden your career, or sometimes even wholesale picking up and moving like some of our panelists have done. It offers you such career diversity and a chance to do what you want, when you want, how you want to do it. And that's just an incredible opportunity that sometimes you don't get in private industry. Um, I'd like to now uh, go to our next question from Charlie Little. Hi, you all. Thank you so much. It's so wonderful to see the lives that y'all have made for yourselves. It's, it's truly inspiring and it's nice to know that it, it can and will be done. Um, my question is, it feels relevant. It's a little bit less like, how do I do this? But um, I was wondering, how much does your work change based on congressional or presidential pushes as they ebb and flow, like, you know, due to administration change or new people that are elected? I'll start it. I, not as much as anyone would think. Uh, it's policy direction. Uh, I know many of the students here may have uh, taken American grand strategy, and that's kind of how national security is framed. Uh, there will be some policy changes, but uh, usually it's a midterm to long term policy and you're not going to see immediate changes in national security because it truly is about keeping America safe. And that does not change overnight. Um, and uh, partisan politics do not play as much into national security um, as we may have seen in the last four years. Yeah, I'll just add as a, as a future operations planner, um, I actually deal with this quite often, but what, what you wanna watch for is the money, right? So where there's money tied to your operations. So what the DOD and the intelligence community are really good at is, hey, we just lost the money to support this. So we're gonna take it from here and move it and do this. And they just, if it's important, it's gonna get done regardless of who's in office.
Okay, Amy Kramer, I think you're up next. Go for it. Thank you all very much uh, for speaking with us this evening. Uh, it sometimes seems like military experience is an unofficial implied job requirement for a lot of senior national security leaders. So I would like to ask if any of you have any practical advice for people, but especially women who don't have a military background about navigating DOD and the national security community. Uh, what are challenges we should be aware of and proactively tackle? And maybe more importantly, are there particular are there particular experiences or credentials that are especially important in lieu of military service that we should uh, seek to earn? Thank you. Uh, I can speak for um, my experience at the agency. Uh, my particular group that I came in with was a mixture of folks straight out of college, some with military, but then there was also, I think we had a chiropractor in our class, you know, it, it was a wide range of backgrounds and really what they were looking for was your aptitude to learn and your skill set and your personality. So it wasn't based on necessarily the job you had before, but your willingness to be able to learn new things and your aptitude to do so. I would just echo that and I'll, I'll hit on a point Marguerite made earlier. It's about not diversity of gender and race and ethnicity as much as gen uh, diversity of experience. Um, and I can speak from uh, former special operations uh, command, uh, government service positions are available. Um, CPAC, we can maybe share this afterwards. There are so many opportunities where you don't have to have any military experience. It uh, could be cyber capability. It could be language. Um, and that's civilian federal careers um, that have great opportunities across all of DOD. Yes, and I'll add in, in the State Department, I mean, we do have a lot of foreign service officers and civil service employees who are um, previous um, military, but that is the minority, I would still say, and even at the senior le um, levels. I, I don't think that it's necessarily an encumbrance on a person if they don't have a military um, background, and it's certainly something that can be learned. I mean, I, for a year before I joined the State Department, I worked with SAIC um, uh, doing policy analysis in the DOD, and I remember um, for the first three weeks, I think I asked no, um, questions only about acronyms. Um, so, I mean, again, <laughs> there are things that you can learn as you enter into the national security field or as you uh, grow through the ranks. Any other parting shots? Well, I'm very sad to say that we are coming near to the end of our session, but before we adjourn for the evening, I would personally like to thank Jenny Randy, Gia, Tina, and Marguerite. And a big thank you for all of us who tuned in today. To the audience, you've been especially gracious. I think this has been a fascinating session with five current national security leaders. They've provided candid, relevant, and timely information, not just about their organizations and their diverse service, but about what it's like to be a woman in national security today from a personal perspective. Clearly all of them have made sacrifices to serve and all of them are committed to paying it forward to help our next generation of professionals succeed in our exceedingly dangerous and complex world. We hope that you've enjoyed this discussion and more importantly, that you will take away some great knowledge to help inform your own career path. Please don't leave the conversation yet because before you leave, there are a couple events coming up that I'd appreciate it if you would mark on your calendars. First, this Wednesday, the 17th of February, we'll hear from Kim Gaddis, an award-winning journalist and author about how the Iran-Saudi Arabia relationship has shaped the modern Middle East. Next Tuesday, February 23rd, AGS is going to host an incredibly interesting panel. They're co-sponsoring it with the Duke Alumni Association to discuss President Biden's first month in office. Our own Professor Shanzer will be there joining three other faculty to talk about the domestic and foreign policy actions that Biden has taken. And a week from today, on Wednesday, February 24th, we'll be hosting a movie night to stream Our War. The documentary follows three foreign soldiers who joined Kurdish forces to fight ISIS in Syria. So it serves as a great complement to some of tonight's discussion. And finally, on behalf of our panelists and our program sponsors, we wish you all a good evening and thanks for tuning in. Until next time, see you later. <laughs>